So, fair warning, I don't teach contracts, but uh, confession, it is a secret fantasy of mine to teach contracts one day. So this is, this is delightful. Okay, so we are going to jump right in. Uh, other, other fun fact, I went back, I still have my contracts casebook, and I appear to have done Lucy versus Zammer on my second day of law school. So that's kind of exciting. Okay, um, so uh, I'm gonna teach this as I would teach this class. So the first thing I would always do is I would review what we did last time because that's how I start every single class. Um, so the three things in this hypothetical world that we did last time are we talked about how a contract requires an agreement we don't impose contracts on people in the absence of an agreement. Second, an agreement requires an offer and an acceptance. You know, for example, I'll buy your house for $300,000 and you say, okay, then we have a deal. Whereas if you say, I'll only sell it for $350,000, then we don't have a contract because I proposed one transaction, you proposed another transaction, and there hasn't been offer and acceptance. That's a counter offer, not an acceptance. And then third, we talked briefly about how acceptance can actually happen in two different ways, right? It can happen in the way I just gave through words. You say, I'll buy your house for $300,000 and you say, okay. Alternatively, you can accept a contract through conduct. For example, if I were to say to my neighbor, I will pay you $20 if you mow my lawn. Well, if my neighbor goes into her garage, gets out the mower, starts up the mower and starts mowing, that's accepting the contract through performance, right? She has commenced performing the transaction that I offered and we have a contract the moment she starts mowing my lawn. She doesn't need to say, okay, right? So those are the three things. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about some nuances about the agreement. Um, specifically when we have an agreement and when we don't have an agreement and how we go about figuring that out. And as we're gonna see over the next week or so, that can actually get surprisingly tricky for a variety of different reasons. And so we're gonna talk about the famous case of Lucy versus Zimmer. Um, I'm gonna start to set the stage, starting with Alexander, who's over there. Um, so right, the Zemmers own something called the Ferguson Farm. And one thing I really noticed when I read this time, this must be one heck of a farm because the case tells us that they've gotten 25 offers to purchase this farm in the last decade. Like lots of people, including Lucy, want this farm. Um, and some from Lucy, who the court tells us is a quote, lumberman and farmer. Um, but up until this point, the Zemmers have always said no. So then one night on December 20th, 1952, uh, for those uh, who paid careful attention to this, this is the Saturday before Christmas, right? Just sort of sets the scene of what's happening. This is the Saturday night before Christmas, 1952. Um, Lucy drives up to Zemmer's restaurant, walks through the front, walks into the back, into the restaurant. And Alexander, what happens next after Lucy sort of hits the back of the restaurant? Yeah, so they sit down and they have a couple of drinks. Uh... Uh, Lucy asks Zemmer if he had sold the Ferguson farm, which he had been interested in now for eight years or so. Zemmer said he not, he hadn't yet. Lucy says to him that he, uh, he bets that Zemmer wouldn't take $50,000 for that place. Uh, Zemmer says yes, but you don't, there's no way you have 50. They go back and forth. Uh, they end up that uh, Zemmer writes uh, on the back of a restaurant check that uh, I agree to sell to Lucy the Ferguson farm for $50,000. Lucy says, uh, I need your wife to also sign it. So they rip up the check, rewrite, they get the wife to sign it, and then it ends up being, uh, we hereby agree to sell to W.O. Lucy the Ferguson farm complete for $50,000, title satisfactory to buyer. And Lucy goes forward assuming that he's got the farm now follows through in the subsequent days. So what do you mean he goes forward? What does he do in the subsequent days? So in the subsequent days, he ends up, uh, next day he arranges with his brother to put up half the money and half the interest of the uh, land. The day after that, he brought in an attorney to examine the title uh, pursuant to that uh, contract. And then he runs into Zemmer again. He says, I've got the farm. And Zemmer says, no, that was a joke. And that was uh, in jest. Okay. Uh, I don't have the, I don't have the farm. So Lucy's acting as if, just to put this all up here, we basically have Lucy the buyer, Lucy wants to buy the farm, Zemmer signs a napkin saying, I agree to sell Lucy the farm for $50,000. They try, again, uh, Lucy tries to give him $5 to bind the bargain, Zemmer won't take the money, and then the next day that Zemmer denies that there is a contract at all. So what we have now is we have a dispute about whether there was an agreement, right? So we're talking about the question of an agreement and offer and acceptance. And the issue that we confront in Lucy is whether there is an agreement um, at all. So Alexander, you said Lucy is the plaintiff. What does Lucy want? Lucy wants a court order 
specific performance plan. It's a court order to get the fine from the Zephyrs. Okay, so that's called specific performance. So what do you suppose the other possible remedy would be? Uh, he wants, if he can't get the farm, he's going to want some sort of money for damages. Right, so one of the questions we'll talk about later, we're not really talking about Lucy for the remedies question here, but just to flag something we'll talk about later in the semester, the two main remedies for contract are damages, and that's the usual remedy, right? Just if you breach a contract, you have to pay. What Lucy wants here is a special kind of remedy called specific performance, which is no, 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 you actually have to go through with the contract. And we'll talk later in the semester about when you can and can't get specific performance. But for enough, uh, for now, it's enough to know specific performance is the standard contract for sales of land. If we're talking about the sale of land, specific performance is actually the normal remedy for the breach of a contract involving the sale of land. Okay, so Alexander, you've already flagged this, so this is an easy one. Um, so why does Zemmer say there is no contract? Right, because that, Zemmer could say there is a contract, but I didn't breach it. But what Zemmer is saying here is we don't have a contract. Why is Zemmer saying we don't have a contract? Because he says it was, a, it was a bluff, it was a dare. He's just forcing Lucy, he's trying to force Lucy to admit that he didn't actually have the $50,000. He wasn't serious about it. Okay, so this is gonna be the last thing for you, then we're gonna go on to Trevor. So I want you to imagine for a moment that you represented Zemmer, yeah. right? Your client wants there not to be a contract because your client does not want to sell this farm. So what's the basic story you're gonna tell on behalf of your client for why this isn't a real agreement? Yeah, so it would be that, you know, Lucy comes into the restaurant, he brings the, the whiskey, um, he, you know, gets me drunk, we start going back and forth, pre-Christmas banter, and then, uh, you know, we have a little back and forth over a, on a restaurant tab, and ultimately it was just a joke, it wasn't something serious. Right, in fact, what, does it, doesn't your client say something to Lucy several times during this? What, it, what does your client say, if you're going to emphasize this, representing Zemmer? So he, he, uh, he says that, um, in terms of just that he wouldn't, uh, that Lucy doesn't have money, he's not going to, uh, that he, he wouldn't. Uh, well, specifically this $5 thing, Zemmer doesn't just refuse to take the $5. What does he say when Lucy tries to give him $5? He ends up saying that that's the beer and liquor talking, that it's not. Right. Your client literally says when the other guy tries to give him $5 to hand the money, he actually says to him, this is just liquor talking. I'm not serious, right? So that's, that's, that's a pretty good fact for your client. Um, also for you know, your life, uh, I don't know if any of you had ever encountered the expression high as a Georgia pine in, ex in reference to being drunk, but I had not until I read this case. So now you've got that to use in your life. Okay, um, so Trevor, let's skip to you. So the question is, is Lucy bound, uh, sorry, is Zemmer bound? What's the court's bottom line answer to whether Zemmer is bound? Yes. He is bound. So let's make sure we understand why. So Zemmer has said, he said, I wasn't serious, I was just joking. Does, does the court say that he was lying? You know, one way you could rule against Zemmer is you could say, I know Zemmer claimed that he was just kidding, but I've considered this and I have concluded that Zemmer is lying when he says that. Is that the reason Zemmer loses? Does the court say we conclude Zemmer is lying? No. He does not lose then. Okay, so then why does he lose if the court doesn't say he's lying? Okay, the court first says it's not about, you're right, it's not about what's going on in his mind. It says it's about his outward acts and what they manifested, and specifically what, what, what is the question of, of whether his acts manifested? What are we trying to determine about what his acts manifested? Did he intend to enter into a contract? Okay, so the question is not internal to him, it's the question of what would an objective, this is the objective test, we're gonna spend a lot of time on this. What would a reasonable observer conclude from his behavior that his intentions were. The question is not what his intentions actually were, it's what his actions would have led a reasonable observer to conclude that his intentions were. And so, in under, Trevor, under the facts of this case, what are the facts, the manifestations, the actions that the court says would lead a reasonable observer to conclude that he did mean to enter into an agreement? Right, okay, so there's a couple things. The court says, one of the ways that we know that you acted like you were serious 
is that you actually took the time to write it down. The vast majority of agreements between people are never reduced to writing. Just think about your life, right? The vast majority of agreements we have with the vast majority of people, the vast majority of the time, no one ever writes things down, right? So you took the time to write it down. And not only did you take the time to write it down, you took the time to rewrite it after you realized that there was a problem with the thing that you wrote down the first time, which is further indication that you're taking this at least somewhat seriously. Um, what other things do they point to, Trevor? I agree those are probably the main two, but there's a few others. Uh, one is that the, the discussion lasted a fairly long amount of time, 30 to 40 minutes, that's what you said. And then also, uh, Lucy, Lucy says that he, he didn't feel particularly Okay, so yeah, despite the fact that this takes place in a bar, we talked for a long time, we actually haggled. One of the things the court tells us is they actually went back and forth about some of the terms, right? There was a question if someone says, you know, shouldn't we make sure the title is okay? They apparently haggled, for example, about when you say the farm, do you mean the farm and all the things on it? Or do you, so then there's this discussion about there's only three cows on the farm, but they're thinking through like the reality, right? Like if I was seriously going to purchase a farm, I'd wonder like, well, does that include the livestock? Does that include the equipment or is it just the physical real estate and there's some indication that they talked about those things all of which would lead the court says a reasonable person to conclude that this was a real discussion as opposed to two people um, just fooling around and at the bottom line the court says because the parties acted like it was a real deal it becomes a real deal the law treats it as a real deal so Trevor, one more question from you. I'm going to read a passage from this case. So this is the part. This is the part where they go, where Zemmer goes over to his wife um, to get her to sign it, right? Because Lucy wants his wife to sign it. And so this is a quote from the case. It says, "Quote: Lucy said, get your wife to sign it." Zemmer walked over to where she was, and at first she refused to sign it, but did so after he told her that he was just needling Lucy. It didn't mean a thing in the world, and I'm not selling the farm. This is the testimony about what happens uh, when Zemmer talks to Mrs. Zemmer. Um, so Trevor, if, if Lucy had heard that exchange between the Zemmers, if the testimony established that Lucy heard that back and forth between the Zemmers, do you think that would do you think there's an argument that would change the result in this case? Lucy hears Zemmer say to Mrs. Zemmer, this is just a joke, it's not real. Yes, I think it would change the result. Why is that? Because from uh, Lucy's perspective, an objective observer hearing that would now think that they do not intend to enter into the market. Okay, so then this becomes really important. What's the evidence about whether Lucy heard that? Do you see that? It's in a different part of the case, but it's actually quite important here. Okay, exactly. There's, the court actually tells us later in the, courts are tricky this way. They sometimes put important facts later in the opinion. There's this quote from the end that both of the Zemmers testified, both of the Zemmers, these are the defendants both testified, that when Zemmer asked his wife to sign, he whispered that it was a joke, and this is key, so that Lucy wouldn't hear and that it was not intended that Lucy would hear right? The court specifically tells us that the defendants admitted that this statement was made sufficiently quietly that there is no reason to believe that Lucy heard it because they actually intended for Lucy not to hear them say it. Okay. So let's talk about the result here in this case. And so I think that, I guess what that illustrates to you is the importance of even very small factual differences. Because I completely agree with Trevor. I think if the evidence were that Lucy had heard that, I think this case almost certainly comes out the other way. Um, so let's talk about the result. Well, at least one of two things could be happening, thinking about what's really going on here, right? So one possibility is that Lucy has um, seller's remorse, that they actually did that night in the bar have a real deal, and that Lucy is lying and trying to back out of a deal that he now regrets having made. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that Zemmer, sorry, Zemmer is trying to back out of what he thinks was a bad deal. The other possibility is that Zemmer did in fact subjectively believe, he's telling the truth, that he did in fact subjectively believe this was a joke, but Lucy did not, right? Those are the sort of two main options. Alexander, let me go back to you. Under the court's rule, does it matter which of those two it is? Well, the, the court rules that it's the, it's the latter of those. That it's the well, does the court rule that's what it actually is, or does the court say that it doesn't matter which of those two it is? If the court believed that Zemmer was honestly, you know, would it, would it matter, basically? It would, well, what matters is what, how the other person interprets it. That's what matters. 
Great. I guess in that regard, it doesn't matter whether you subjectively believe it's the truth or you subjectively Right. So the court actually tells us this at the bottom of the opinion. They say, quote, whether the writing was a result of a serious offer by Lucy and a serious acceptance by the defendants, or if it was a serious offer by Lucy, an acceptance by secret jest of the defendant, in either event, it constituted a binding instrument between the parties. The court is saying it does not matter whether Lucy subjectively believed they had an agreement or not. You could prove, even if you could hook Lucy up to an infallible lie detector test, right? And you could establish with 100% certainty that Lucy actually thought it was a joke. Sorry, Zemmer, I keep screwing that up. Zemmer thought it was a joke. It would not matter. What the hell is up with that? Okay, so, right, the very first thing we said is that we don't impose contracts on people who haven't agreed, and now we're the court saying, actually, sometimes we do impose contracts on people who did not subjectively intend to agree. Alexander, can you help me out with this? Why, why, why do we do that, do you suppose? Let's posit that, Luce, that Zemmer is telling the truth. It was a secret jest and we are holding him to this contract. Why would we have such a rule, do you suppose? So the concern is if you take a subjective approach and you have just that set of facts play out, then it makes it very difficult for contracts to be enforced at all, period. Um, and if you want you know, a, a system set in place where people can trust that they enter into a contract that is actually going to be enforced, it makes it very difficult if you go with anything other than an objective test. Okay. So, so there's really two things there. I think you focus, one way to think about this question is to think about the, the, the effect on both the buyer and the seller. And what Alexander was just saying there was focusing on the buyer, was focusing on Lucy, right? Lucy doesn't know whether this is secret jest or not. Lucy goes about his life. I mean, this, the facts of this case are actually great because what does Lucy do? Lucy, he arranges financing. Lucy hires a lawyer who inspects the time. Lucy relies on the belief that this is a real deal that the two of them made. Like, Lucy went out and organized his life around the idea that they had an agreement, right? And he doesn't know what someone's secret intent in their, back, in their heart is. And one of the arguments for contract law, right, is that it, it allows people to make agreements with each other it then allows people to make plans in reliance on those agreements, and it makes everybody better off because we're able to act on the assumption that when we think we have a deal, we can order our lives on the assumption that we have the deal, right? Um, so one of them focuses on that. I think what Alexander says is absolutely right and focuses on Zemmer, uh, sorry, on Lucy in this situation. The other question is about Zemmer. The other reason that you might think that we might have this rule is because the truth is, in the real world, we don't have an infallible lie detector test, right? In the world, if we create a test that allows a party to say, I subjectively didn't intend for us to have an agreement, we are opening up all manner of difficulty, litigating after the fact whether parties did or did not have an agreement any time that one party to the contract later regrets the choice to enter into the agreement and then wants to argue that we didn't actually have an agreement, right? That the subjective test, I think another explanation for its rejection is that it would open up all matter of shenanigans on the part of people who regret deals they made if all they have to do later is say, I didn't really mean it at the time. Well, speaking of time, uh, we are out of time for now. So I will see you all tomorrow and we'll talk about the drunk part of this case.